In the middle years of the last century, many believed the millennium was at hand. Some believed a Messiah, as promised by all the great religions, was about to deliver us into the promised land. Others believed deliverance would come about through science and technology. With the advances being made in communication and transportation, ideas raced around the world and promised deliverance through knowledge. But no Messiah descended from the clouds. Science and technology only brought greater suffering, and for all its many blessings, education failed to stop the darkness from descending. The world's governments and the world's religions offered no answers. On into our own century, people began to wonder, had God abandoned the world? Was God, in fact, dead? Is it possible, however, that the frenzy of expectation was justified, that an event that would transform the world actually did take place, and humanity missed it. Is it possible that the world failed to recognize the power of a new prophet? Count Leo Tolstoy, the Russian novelist and one of the most important philosophers of his time, from his home outside Moscow. We spend our lives trying to unlock the mystery of the universe, but there was one man, a prisoner in Akka, who had the key. Promises of a paradise on Earth continue to be cruel deceptions. The people of the world appear even more impotent as the forces of evil threaten to diminish and eclipse the human spirit. The strife that divides and afflicts the human race is daily increasing. The winds of despair are blowing from every direction. The well-being of mankind, its peace and security are unattainable until its unity is firmly established. He spoke to us over 100 years ago from a prison cell in the Middle East. He wrote that God had set in motion historical forces that no power on earth can resist. The time foreordained unto the peoples and kindreds of the earth is now come. The earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. His name was Baha'u'llah and his growing influence is the great untold story of our times. I am the royal falcon on the arm of the Almighty. I unfold the drooping wing of every broken bird and start it on its flight. His given name was Mirza Hussein Ali. He was born in Persia in 1817 and spent his youth in the pastoral countryside of Nur, the son of a nobleman of great wealth. He grew up in a closed world of intolerance and injustice, a world of repression. But he rejected the wealth and the advancement it offered. The learning current amongst men I studied not, their schools I entered not. Ask of the city wherein I dwelt, and thou mayest be well assured that I am not one of them who speak falsely. Already at an early age, he had a vision that was in conflict with the state and the prevailing religious order. It wasn't long before the state found his support of a movement that called for moral reform threatening. He was arrested and imprisoned in Tehran's worst prison, the Black Pit of Siachal. No pen can depict that place, nor any tongue describe its loathsome smell. It was a place foul beyond comparison. His enemies hoped imprisonment would kill Baha'u'llah. Instead, in the darkness of Siachal, he was summoned to undertake a mission extending far beyond his own land and his own time. Though the weight of the change in the stench-filled air allowed me but little sleep, I felt as if something flowed from the crown of my head over my breast as a mighty torrent from the summit of a lofty mountain. Every limb of my body would be set afire. Baha'u'llah left that prison and was exiled to the territories of the Turkish Empire. It was in exile that he announced his mission. 
This is the day in which mankind can hear the voice of the promised one. Soon will the present day order be rolled up and a new one spread out in its stead. Baha'u'llah really opened a whole new horizon there. He explained that the creator has always communicated with his creation by means of special individuals. Abraham, Moses, Buddha, Zoroaster, Krishna, Christ, Muhammad. They all spoke with knowledge that came from the same source and led to the same goal. And uh, they came at different times, spoke to very different people, and unlocked different capacities, both individually and in people as a society. And in this day and age, it is Baha'u'llah who speaks to us with that same authority in that same line. And the capacity he came to unlock is the unity of mankind. Baha'u'llah reaffirmed that message even as he was exiled to the empire's most remote and desolate prison in Akka, a port city on the north coast of Palestine in the Holy Land. This was the end of the world, and his imprisonment was meant to silence him forever. Know that though my body be beneath the swords of my foes and my limbs be beset with incalculable afflictions, yet my spirit is filled with a gladness with which all the joys of the earth can never compare. From his prison cell in exile, Baha'u'llah sent letters to the kings and rulers of the 19th century world. These letters are among the most remarkable documents in religious history. He called upon the leaders to join in a process of global consultation that would lay the foundations of the world's great peace. Should any king take up arms against another, all should unitedly arise and prevent him. He challenged the most powerful leaders of the world, from the Shah of Persia to the Tsar of Russia, Queen Victoria of England, Emperor Franz Joseph of Austria, the Sultan of Turkey, Pope Pius IX, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, and Napoleon III of France. What he said in these letters that he wrote to them was that God had set in motion historical forces that were bringing about the unification of mankind and the creation of this new society. And he called on them to participate in this process. They had the capacity had they been willing to uh, focus on reality instead of on their own private agendas, they had the capacity to give an enormous impulse to this process of the unification of mankind. They had it in their power to help mankind to reconcile itself to its unity, to begin to let go slowly of attachment to lesser identities, lesser loyalties that were limiting, and surrender to them to the currents of history they chose not to Baha'u'llah's letters also foretold with breathtaking accuracy the fall of the rulers who did not join in the pursuit of the great peace Napoleon the third unexpectedly fell The Turkish Sultan was overthrown and the Ottoman Empire collapsed. Papal rule ended in Italy. And the German Empire was devastated by successive wars in Europe. Baha'u'llah's vision extended beyond the era in which he lived. He warned of the consequences of resisting the oneness of humanity. Witness how the world is being afflicted with a fresh calamity every day. Its tribulation is continually deepening. One must discover the cause of the disease and grasp the knowledge of the remedy. As our planet shrinks, it seems to become more dangerous. But is it coming apart? Or is it coming together? Is it breaking up or becoming one? That which the Lord hath ordained as the sovereign remedy for the healing of all the world is the union of all its people in one universal cause. Baha'u'llah writes that the breaking up and the coming together are part of the same process. A new life is in this age stirring within all the peoples of the earth. 
all men have been created to carry forward an ever advancing civilization. This is, according to the Baha'i teachings, the coming of age of mankind. We've passed our babyhood, our childhood, our adolescence. Now we're young adults. We've come of age. We've reached maturity, you see, which is a very graphic thing uh, biologically. And that is a symbol of what has happened in the world today. So suddenly the whole world finds that it can, and not only can, but must learn to live together on a very small planet. The revelations of Baha'u'llah, which appear in several thousand tablets and books, reveal how humankind can live in a global society. The prisoner of Akka called for the abandonment of all forms of prejudice and for establishment of a world federation. He said that true religion is in harmony with reason and the pursuit of scientific knowledge. He wrote that it was the responsibility of each individual to independently search for truth. As Baha'u'llah's reputation and moral influence spread, he left prison and was confined in a house outside Akka. He continued to write and speak out even under his new confinement. In 1890, Edward Granville Brown, a brilliant Cambridge scholar specializing in Middle East studies, visited Baha'u'llah. Brown came to Baji, then Baha'u'llah's country home, now restored as a holy place and the center of one of the world's fastest growing religious faiths. He wrote about his meeting with Baha'u'llah, recording his powerful words and passionate commitment to peace and unity. Baha'u'llah had a profound effect on Brown. He was a wondrous and venerable figure. Those piercing eyes seemed to read one's very soul. Power and authority sat on that ample brow. No need to ask in whose presence I stood, as I bowed myself before one who is the object of a devotion and love, which kings might envy and emperors sigh for in vain. Thou hast come to see a prisoner and an exile. We desire but the good of the world, yet they deem us a stirrer up of strife and sedition worthy of bondage. All nations should become one in faith and all men brothers. The bonds of affection and unity should be strengthened. Diversity of religion should cease and differences in races be annulled. So it shall be. These fruitless strifes, these ruinous wars shall pass away and the most great peace will come. What Brown had glimpsed in 1890, over five million people around the world now believe that Baha'u'llah is the messenger of God to our age. At a time when others are writing God out of history, the followers of Baha'u'llah are part of a community called Baha'i. The Encyclopedia Britannica calls Baha'i the second most widespread religious body on earth. Though the world center is in Haifa, Baha'i communities exist in every country and territory in the world. Baha'is find their inspiration in the revelation of Baha'u'llah and in his commitment to justice and world peace. They are without priests and without icons or rituals. They believe that the fundamental basis of existence is in the relationship of humankind with God. The word of God hath set the heart of the world afire. How regrettable if ye fail to be enkindled with its flame. The reason that we are Baha'is is not only because we believe that it's a divine truth from Almighty God, but we believe that it's practical, can do something, solve something, create something. Baha'is confront the problems of contemporary society directly. They do so guided by the writings of Baha'u'llah. Recently, Baha'is played a major role in the environmental summit in Rio. The fundamental spiritual truth of our age is the oneness of humanity. On the local level, as in this town in Ireland, Baha'is work to help save the planet. Be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age ye live in and center your energy on its requirements. 
Baha'u'llah called for the establishment of a world parliament 100 years before the creation of the United Nations. It must be, he wrote, the trustee of all that dwell on earth, and to it, national governments must surrender a measure of their sovereignty. Particularly important in Baha'u'llah's writings is the role of women in building a new global society. Women and men are and always have been equal in the sight of God. Exalted is he who hath resolved differences and established harmony. Praised be he who hath conferred upon all a station and rank on the same plane. One of the aspects that, um, of women's development in Asia, in accordance to Baha'u'llah's writing, has been in the way of education of girls. Well, in many of Asian society, girls are not given priority when it comes to education. But in Baha'u'llah's writing, girls are to be given the priority. Well, Baha'u'llah says that if you have money, or if you are only able to educate one child and you have to choose between the boy and the girl, you are to choose the girl because the mothers will be the first educators of the next generation. Mahala talks of equality of men and women. And uh, I, I come from Africa where women are normally um, suppressed by the men and they are not recognized as such. But now here is Mahala speaking with the voice of God saying in this day and age, men and women are equal and they should be treated as such. It's therefore very confirming for women to know that that is what God has ordained for us women today. The words of Baha'u'llah are put into practice by local spiritual assemblies around the world and in the Baha'i World Center at the House of Justice on Mount Carmel in the Holy Land. The self-governing democratic assemblies stress the importance of consultation in every sphere of human activity. Take ye counsel together in all matters, inasmuch as consultation is the lamp of guidance which leadeth the way. It is the bestower of understanding. There are over 18,000 democratically elected Baha'i councils throughout the world. Inspired by Baha'u'llah, the prophet of transformation, Baha'is believe that in addition to elevating the spirit, their faith offers concrete ways to solve social and economic problems. We start with the present systems, as you can see, many age-old and respected institutions are crumbling. And those that were supposed to have uh, helped uh, many nations to overcome their uh, socio-economic uh, problems, they are in trouble. What is really missing is a spiritual dimension again to the way we look at socio-economic development. It is totally missing. And when we uh, take the writings of Baha'u'llah, uh, he has a holistic approach to the problem. Uh, definitely, uh, economics uh, need to be seen uh, with a perspective of spirituality, the nature of man, the purpose for his being here. Let your vision be world-embracing rather than confined to your own selves. Man's merit lieth not in the pageantry of wealth, but in service and virtue. Basically, in my job as a physician, um, it's basically a service-oriented uh, job. And Baha'is believe that work offered in the spirit of service is equivalent to worship. So uh, I feel by, by performing my job, uh, trying to maintain the, the sense of service to the people that I'm serving, I'm essentially praying every day. Initially, I was attracted to the spirit of the faith. The, my heart was touched by the teachings of Baha'u'llah. My mind came later. Then gradually, I investigated the teachings of Baha'u'llah. And through that, I discovered a purpose for myself. Um, I discovered I, I wanted to better myself, to educate myself, to, uh, to have a career, to make a contribution to society. Baha'u'llah's writings call for the equality of all kindred on the earth, finding strength in unity and diversity. There can be no doubt whatever that the peoples of the world, of whatever race or religion, derive their inspiration from one heavenly source. 
cleave unto you, that which draweth you together and uniteth you. The teaching of unity and diversity which Baha'u'llah brought to this world, it helps people um, to see differences not as something threatening, but something that makes the world a beautiful place to live in. Every human being is like a flower, and the more diverse uh, the flowers in a garden are, the more beautiful it will be. When you explain the Baha'i teachings, unity of mankind, equality, men and women, and one international language, so on and so forth, I was not going to that part. They all say that it's wonderful. That's wonderful. But, but, it is utopia. It is utopia in Greek. It means that it's very good, but you cannot put in the practice. But Baha'u'llah, when he declared unity of mankind, he did that. You can go to the Baha'i meetings everywhere. They came different background of religious background, national background, racial backgrounds, and they are united under the banner of Baha'u'llah. Regard ye not one another as strangers. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. Humanity. Since the coming of Baha'u'llah, their hearts have been changed. They do not desire just to be isolated. That does not mean that you give up your culture and your way of life. Let not a man glory in this, that he loves his country. Let him rather glory in this, that he loves his kind. Because Baha'u'llah is the manifestation of God, his words have power like it had power before with Jesus or Moses or Krishna or Buddha or Muhammad or Zoroaster. The same thing. It's power and people feel it. Baha'u'llah bedeutet eigentlich mein ganzes Leben für mich und ich bin unheimlich glücklich, dass ich ihn anerkannt habe als Manifestation für dieses Zeitalter. Baha'u'llah is my Lord and his teachings are my hope for the world. Santi Leonat Lagi Aiko Bhavan Bhavla. Baha'u'llah means everything. It's the fulfillment of all the dreams that people are waiting for. Il me semblait que ces religions devaient s'accorder sur quelques points et c'est ce que j'ai trouvé en Baroula. Baroula est le plus merveilleux que j'ai trouvé en ma vie. Il est toujours ouvert et ouvert à la vie de la vie. Baroula, il m'a toujours aimé avec lui dans la vie. Baroula, comme la manifestation de Dieu. Baroula, comme la manifestation de Dieu. Baroula, c'est une lumière que la hatred ne peut pas stand. That light has continued to burn despite the persecution which began in Baha'u'llah's time. The persecution has intensified in our own time under the Islamic revolutionary regime. But the words and works of Baha'u'llah, the light that hatred cannot stand, are continually illumined and heightened by the growing faithful, who dedicate their lives to becoming one with each other and one with God. Each human being has potentially all the attributes of God within him. What, what the purpose of life is, is to develop these capacities. And the, the role of the messenger of God, like sunshine with plants, is to awaken these capacities. Baha'u'llah says that what God's purpose is, is to uh, awaken us to our own real nature. The whole earth is in a state of pregnancy. The day is approaching when it will yield its noblest fruits, its most enchanting blossoms. Glorified is the breeze that wafteth from the Lord, for it shall make all things new.
On May 28, 1892, Baha'u'llah, the prisoner of Akka, passed from this life. His shrine at Baji has become the focal point of the devotion of over five million people who believe him to be the messenger of God to our age. They believe that his coming has breathed new life into the body of humankind and made all things new. One hundred years after his death, thousands gathered at Baha'u'llah's home and his shrine at Baji, where the work, begun in a prison cell years before, reached its most soul-stirring climax. They commemorated what they called his ascension by keeping vigil throughout the night. In an act of devotion and love, they circumambulated the shrine, orbiting it as the planets orbit the sun. They came from the most remote corners of the globe to pay homage to one whose greatest miracle was to unite their hearts. What is it that these people have witnessed? Could it be that their hearts have been opened by the revelation of God's messenger to our time? The world is but one country, and mankind its citizens. Let not a man glory in this, that he loves his country. Let him rather glory in this, that he loves his kind.